Welcome back, everyone, for day two of theCUBE. We're live here in Atlanta for Supercomputing 2024, or SC24. I'm John Furrows of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, Savannah Peterson, Chris McCall. Our whole team is here, wall-to-wall -wall coverage with Silicon Angle and theCUBE. We've got a great panel here talking about the AI factory. We've got some CUBE alumni here. we got Arun, who's the SVP of Portfolio Management from Dell. Welcome back, good to see you. Uh, and we got Hassan, who's the head of software products and ecosystem at Broadcom, and Vasali, who's the Ch executive officer, global ecosystem partners at Denver DataWorks, all returning back to theCUBE. Great to see you guys, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. So AI Factory's hot. First of all, Dell has an amazing trailer. They brought, brought the factory, their booth has got the great products, so congratulations. The machines look phenomenal. Um, they look great, they got all the great gear in them. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a top seller, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcom, I've been doing the magic with the chips. Thanks for what you do and talk about that as well. In Denver, you guys doing the large scale yes. factory. So let's get into it. You get a little prop here, which I love. Yeah. You brought the factory uh, yeah, model, I, the model home, is it that you call it? Tell us what you got here. Yeah, I brought my private zone, Denver DataWorks private zone, which is a modular uh, super cluster. It can house 128 uh, nodes uh, times eight, so uh, more than 1,000 GPUs in an extremely efficient footprint, less than 900 square feet, 1.5 megawatt power and water free with liquid immersion cooling. We can also do liquid to the chip. And our goal here is to uh, work uh, more um, uh, in partnership with Dell and Broadcom to populate um, the, the GPU servers as well as networking and storage racks. Yeah. So what you see here is the liquid immersion tanks and then what you see here is the networking and storage racks and that are all going to be populated with uh, Dell and uh, Broadcom networking hopefully soon. So. What I love about this wave we're in right now is last year we saw the excitement and the confidence that AI now and HPC are coming together, that's clear. Now you're starting to see the proof points of, of, of the hardware or systems that are now out, and now the components and the footprint <laughs> is yes. here. So th take us through the benefits of this. What's changed from this year, last year to this year, and why is this uh, on the roadmap? Why is this happening? Is it footprint, is it all the efficiencies? What's the main driver for the, the new change of the factory? Yeah, and I think you said it, uh, said it out very nicely. If customers are looking for more open architectures, and also they want to make sure that they can have total cost of ownership savings when it comes to power, cooling, and the amount of space that is required. We all know that everybody's running out of data center power and space. So how do you figure out, and most of the AI workloads are very power hungry, so how do you figure out uh, how to deploy AI workloads in the fastest possible manner in the lowest TCO with lowest power and lowest uh, cooling requirement. So that is exactly why we dis, uh, designed our uh, Denver DataWorks uh, private zone uh, in partnership with uh, Broadcom and, and Dell so that we can give customer different choices and options as well as open architecture. Uh, liquid immersion cooling as well as liquid to the chip cooling really yeah. uh, uh, results in the efficient power usage yeah. as well as compact footprint. Right, our goal is to provide customers uh, a, a modular data center campus, so we can actually offer four of these together to create a large data center campus in less than six months. Yeah. So <laughs> think about it, like how fast we can help enterprise deploy these AI workloads yeah. in, in very limited time. Yeah, what's exciting is, is that you mentioned AI workloads, the characteristics of those workloads today are demanding the new capabilities which you're showing Arun Hassan, this is also another another area that you guys are working on. That's another problem area, which is I need more power, no more, more less power, more performance on the, the the machines, and I got energy to deal with. So I got, yes. I got I, space is limited, and power and cooling is a huge constraint, and I want more horsepower. I want more speeds and fees. I want price performance. These are the three hardest problems that I would say summarize this. Could you guys talk about how that factors? Because the workloads are hungry. They're yes. they're coming yeah. on fast. Yep. So let, let me tell you what we're doing at Dell, right? I mean, clearly rack power, right? If you think of the previous generations, they were like 20 kilowatt racks, right? I mean, the average enterprise is 20 kilowatt rack. The first generation of AI with the 9680 was a 50 kilowatt rack. Now with GB200 and the next generation, they're going to be greater than 100 kilowatt racks. There is no way air cooling can do that level of cooling for 100 kilowatt racks. We need liquid cooling, direct to chip liquid cooling. We need open standards which means that both networking and servers all have to fit into a rack scale infrastructure. So a data center like what she's showing there yeah. will be an amazing place for a rack scale infrastructure to work. Efficient power, efficient performance. That's what we're seeing right now in the industry. Yeah, solving those problems is key. Networking has come up a lot. I saw Broadcom, you guys have been nailing the efficiency side of it and also the energy requirements. 
Yeah. Uh, so, John, it's um, so this. What I'm holding out here is a Tomahawk 5, right? It's a 51. Surprise point. with a prompt. Hold on. What is it? on that, Tony. Zoom in on There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is like billions of transistors, 51.2 terabit. You know, Dell has been a great partner building systems based on them being one of the first to market with this. Now, this is at least a generation ahead of anybody else out in the industry. So think of this as if you're building systems based on this, when Arun's team is building systems based on this, they can replace six previous generation with one. So that's about a 75% savings in power, space, cooling, right, yep. that you can get with this. Now, this also couples its connectivity into the server is we have a portfolio of AI NICs that we've introduced, right? right? That NIC is an 18 watt NIC, it's called a 400 gig NIC, it's called Thor 2. That's the lowest power in the industry. Then to connect both of these, you know, we have the best CERDES out there in the industry. So what you can do with this is you can get four meter reach over copper. This means that when you're connecting within the rack, across racks, you don't need to use optics, which consume a lot of power, right? You save on power, you save on cost. And lastly, I would say we have other major investments. For example, we are investing in something called linear drive optics, mm -hmm. right? These are optics with, uh, uh, where we remove the DSPs, less electrical components, so less power usage, yeah. lower cost, but also very reliable. And we also are showing on this show something called co-package optics, right? This is something that we have invested in multiple generations. Um, but as systems become more dense, right, you have to put more yeah. optics in there. You can now co-package these optics and you can get up to 70% savings from a power perspective. Yeah. So absolutely, right, this is top of mind yeah. for us uh, when we are doing this work, when we are working with our partners yeah. like with Dell and, and, and Denver. You know, it's interesting, you mentioned the, the components. I saw your booth with the fiber, the chips got all that innovation in it. It's like a super chip. Um, and it just, it just takes so much more um, complexity out of it from a component standpoint, but also energy, the efficiency. So this is kind of the innovation. This is the, to me, this panel encapsulates the show because you got real engineering innovation yep. going on happening. That's, a, that's the fruits coming off the tree in this wave right now. And then the, the workloads need to run it. So if you zoom out, you say, okay, the engineering is getting done. The workloads now have form factors. So the three problems is space, energy, and mm -hmm. price performance, all hitting. Yes. That's pretty much what's happening here. Yes. Now the workloads, what's going on in the workloads? Uh, I, would, I would start, meaning, so we see uh, some of the top use cases like training as a service, yep. inference as a service, model as a service, RAG as a service. And I think networking is extremely important in all three use cases that I just described. Uh, you don't want network to ever come into the way of applications or workloads. And I feel like with AI, networking has become glamorous again. You know, I, f I feel like it's like back to the 90s when networking was just taking off. And yeah. now, uh, you know, we have worked with Broadcom pretty much, yeah. like I've been in the industry for more than 27 years, yeah. and we have worked with Broadcom um, at my um, previous employers. And I think it's just amazing to see how the, the whole cluster networking yeah. fabric need to come together to make sure that there is uh, low latency, super high throughput, yeah. that really leverages the power of the compute that is available from all these powerful GPUs from NVIDIA's and uh, yeah. others, um, so. You know, you mentioned back to the 90s, that's come up a lot. And again, yeah. not to date myself, but I remember uh, when open systems really kicked in, the OSI model, but really that was TCP IP and then yeah. all the standards below that kind of kicked in, a real wave of innovation happened, but couple one, it created a whole nother, it's just, whole other thing happened. But what was really interesting was new things kept coming yep. out, right? More engineering, so you saw more revisions. So what, what was key about that is everything worked downstream with each other. So yeah. if you bought something earlier, the next thing works with it, but it got better. So it was a, I won't say leapfrog, but it was just an advancement in, in price performance. We're living that now, what you guys are doing. We're seeing it from last year to this year. Talk about that innovation, because there's real innovation going on. Um, you mentioned networking, so everything's, being innovative. So can you guys talk about the, the Dell Broadcom piece because there'll be something next year. Yeah. You mentioned that you're ahead of the competition because of the engineering. So this is like no BS time. No it's BS like, time. This is like get down and dirty and get the get it engineering done. I'll start with Ben and Hassan yeah. can cover, right? So we are, we are working really closely with Broadcom. I'll, I'll say a few key tenants, right? The Dell Broadcom partnership is about open systems. Right, we want Ethernet as the technology of choice. We believe yeah. Ethernet will be the technology of choice for AI networking, but ever increasing speeds in bandwidth, right? I mean, so right now we have 800 gig NICs. Uh, we have 800 gig switches. 
We are getting to 1.60, right? I mean, that's where we're working closely with Broadcom. We want to be time to market, first to market, but we want interoperability, right? You buy an asset today, yeah. you want that asset to live for 18 months to 24 months. The next asset comes along, it has to be interoperable. Our technology innovation is in the latest and greatest, 1.60, Tomahawk 6, that's coming out later on. We are working very closely with Broadcom to partner with that. Yeah, so just to piggyback off um, our own, right? It's, and, and the workloads, right? You know, this workload is very unique, right? It's different characteristics. I think this is where Denver had the vision yeah. to say, look, a regular cloud is, cannot just do GP as a service as is because the workload is different in its characteristics. You have very few flows, there are very large flows. If you're doing training, these jobs run for a very long time. So you, in, you know, from customers, what we have heard is initially, look, hey, 57 to 60% of the time is spent in networking, yeah. right? I spent $2 billion on this infrastructure and I, I can't use it 60% of the time. I bought this brand new Ferrari and you're telling me to park this in the garage at 20 out of the 30 days. So, but, you know, how do you solve these problems, right? This is, you know, how do you have advanced load balancing capabilities? How do you do congestion control? How do you do recover from failures, yeah. right? Recovering from failures is a very important aspect. Um, in addition to density and performance, and what we have done is working with Dell, you know, seeking feedback from people like Denver, incorporated these capabilities, which Dell has now introduced as systems, and we are in these conversations, yes. right? How are we going to take it to the next level? And as you see a couple of years out, you'll see products come out that will reflect that. Yeah, and then the open's critical. I think, again, back to the customers who want to run the workloads, we're seeing this, okay, Transformers came out, thank you very much. That takes all the, I call old AI algorithm, levels them up, and then after the Transformers hit, the architecture changed. We're seeing we, you guys yep. are doing that, and now the software gets better, so you have new software. And then the architecture is going to change. And then now new software is coming yep. out. So software is driving it. And anyone doing Gen AI has to have the software asset driving everything. We know that. We've been talking about it on the cube all day long. But now when you get to the performance of the hardware, okay, or system now, it's a system. It's not just a box. 100%. This is a key yeah. point. So that everyone wants to know, do I use liquid cooling here? Do I do power uh, cooling on chip there? Do I use air cooling here? You don't have to have one thing. You got to make a selection. So you're. The, the successful people are building the systems yep. on premise and then connecting it to the cloud. Yep. So it's not about the cloud versus on premise, it's like, what's the system? So we're in a systems revolution. Again, back to the 90s, it's not just networking, <laughs> it's everything. So can you guys opine on that? Because I think this is a point everyone's, uh, and the customer base that we talk to is not struggling with, but they're working hard to figure out, okay, what's my system architecture look like? Because I want to tie business value to it. Because this yeah. isn't just, get email. Yeah, yeah. let me start. I mean, like, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Great, great point, right? So, I, I'll tell you, we, we do a lot of the big deals right now, right? Yeah. I mean, it has gone, I mean, like, we were selling boxes, like, 18 months ago, two years ago. Now, the real conversation is, what is a rack scalable system? How does the server, how does the storage, how does the network all connect together, perform at the peak cap capacity, right? I mean, like, Hassan is absolutely right. If you build a, 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 a $4 million rack, and you're sitting on a network that's not optimized, it doesn't work. Yeah. So customers are asking for, to us at Dell, is get me a rack scalable system that is fully performance tuned and optimized out of the factory yeah. that I can plug into a modular data center like that and plug and play. Time to value yeah. is about optimizing the system. And yeah. that's what we're working on right now. And yeah. this is where we have worked very closely with Dell in this partnership that Dell is extremely good at solutions, right? Yeah. So we know that you know when people are rolling this out, when Denver is rolling this out, they don't want here is a switch, here is a NIC, right? Yeah. Here is storage, here is some operating system. It's the entire thing. Yeah. And what we have done is working with Dell, there are validated designs yes. that are now available where you can, how do you build the end-to-end -end system and it's completely validated, right? From a hardware, software, optics, a perspective that can just be consumed off the bat. Yeah, this, think, go ahead. And I think that's very important, right? So what Dell and Broadcom provides, we create a full software AI stack yeah. on top of it, which is very, very important because again, yeah. we want to make sure that customers are benefiting from the open architecture, the sonic networking operating system, and also other open architectures in the AI stack. So starting from the optimizing of the data center for power, cooling, and space, then layering the yeah. networking and storage fabric 
on top of it, which is yeah. based on the open standards, then doing platform orchestration, which yeah. is based on Kubernetes and et cetera, and then providing REST APIs to the customer to yeah. bring their AI workloads to, uh, to address their key business outcomes yeah. like employee productivity yeah. enhancement, manufacturing improvements, detail yeah. uh, insights, what customers are buying, healthcare drug discovery, yeah. acceleration and whatnot. So I think it all goes yeah. together from the software open architecture perspective with yeah. optimized power space and cooling. You know, what's really interesting, what you guys are doing is so fascinating because the old expression, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. <laughs> yeah. Well guess what, we're getting it. It's party time in tech. I did that on the pod, whole segment on our podcast is party time, meaning every layer of the stack is is happening. Yeah. And and you mentioned networking. It's not just a box and servers are networking. It's networking in what you're building. And so you have an opportunity to build a, a system yes. that you want. Thanks. And you can do it right. Yeah. But and it's not out of it's not so much out of the box like the old days, but it is being built. And I think that's the key when we saw the IT build out in that first wave was rack and stack. You have yeah. built it out. Here, it's a similar concept, but it's a system. Take us through how you guys did it and what are some of the uh, successes and what's the, how do you make the choices? Do I use this for that? Because once you get it, the components with networking with Broadcom, you get the Dell systems. How do you build it? Yeah, what that's a great outcome? question. I think um, it is very, very important to keep in mind what customers are looking to do with their generative AI, right? So working backwards from that is always very, very helpful. So we learn from our customers that they are looking for employee productivity enhancements, uh, code generation, uh, as I mentioned, financial services, risk management, uh, fraud detection, things like that, right? So how, now, now you take those business outcomes and map them to the key use cases, which is training as a service or inference as a service. Many of them would start from the open source uh, uh, LLMs out there and then they want to fine tune and then add RAG, retrieval augmentation yeah. generation to it, right? So we understood all of those requirements very clearly from our customers and partners and making sure that what we are building at Denver DataWorks with our Denver Cloud, it gives them optionality, choice, and flexibility with the right scale to make it their own, right? Yeah. And that was very, very important for us to create this optimized data center footprint as well as create that software AI stack that I just talked about, so that yeah. it meets all of those business outcomes and yeah. use cases that I, I talked about. And we also have very talented team coming from enterprise um, banking yeah. um, environment, as well as um, our CEO who has done multiple yeah. different startups before, and then uh, all the other engineers, as well as um, the leadership team. Yeah. The, they have tremendous AI and the data center background. So it, it yeah. You know, people do matter. <laughs> so you want to make sure that yeah. when you have a great idea, you get the right people to build the right product together. It's a together. builder culture right now. And yes. again, that's why I like that back to the 90s comment. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you a specific question around the disruption enablement. I yeah. used that word very specifically, intentionally. It's disrupting, but it's enabling. Yeah. You saw that with TCP IP and networking in the old days. Mm -hmm. All this new standard, op open standards created enablement which created opportunities for entrepreneurs, companies were born, new yeah. use cases. What are the disruptive enablers that you're seeing come out of this on your end as you roll out the capabilities? Is it faster software? Are people happier? Are people getting along? Are apps being built faster? What are some of the, the outcomes that you're seeing uh, from this? And, and I think disruption is, is key, right? When ChatGPT came out, uh, we didn't know the disruption it is going to drive, right? In, in like two months, it had like a you know, wildfire-like adoption. So we want to make sure that we are able to disrupt the, the AI industry by providing customer the right footprint. Like, if you want to deploy AI workload, you should not have to wait for two years, right? Okay. Uh, and, it, and with the lack of power, yeah. space, and cooling uh, technologies available today, it could take two years. So the first disruption we wanted to do is, how do we create this uh, minimal footprint yeah. with the with the uh, largest power uh, capacity <coughs> possible so that we can deploy a cluster in less than six months. So that's the first disruption. The second is the, the whole open architecture that we have created with uh, Dell and Broadcom support with the Sonic. It's, it's so sleek yeah. when we are deploying the cluster, our entire networking is completely automated. It's literally a touch of a button and then a whole networking gets provisioned then the storage gets provisioned, then the platform yeah. orchestration gets provisioned, right? So being open, at the same time providing choice, flexibility, yeah. and providing the lowest TCO is also so very- Flexibility, you can stand up very fast infrastructure exactly. for them. 
Arun, talk about where this goes, because you guys are, are, are supplying all the, the components, servers, everything. Yep. Broadcom's got the networking, everything's working together. What's the portfolio look like? What are some of the choices people have? And what are people, how are they thinking through this right now? Because I think it's a great question, right? I mean, as we go forward, there are many choices. When you think about rack scale architecture, <coughs> excuse me, when you think about rack scale architecture, yeah. you have NVL72, NVL4, highly scalable yeah. systems, right? Massive systems. Then there are people who want liquid cooling when they want 100, 100 kilowatt racks. So there's a liquid cooling choices. Then there's choice of PCIe, GPU inference, right? Inference as a service. You don't need these rack scale systems. You can have inference as a service. So what we are trying to do at Dell is offer customers the entire choice from an extremely large scale rack scalable system for training as a service all the way down to enterprises who want to just do a small scale deployment. So SLMs and we have yeah. that solution. So Dell is trying to provide the gamut of choice across the entire AI infrastructure as we go forward. So talk about the openness in this because now the products are coming out. You guys are innovating in all these areas that, you know, frankly, is going to accelerate more capability and performance, lower energy. What's next on the horizon? Obviously, Ethernet's open. That's getting faster. What are the hot areas, so to speak? <laughs> we got cooling, that's good, it's hot. <laughs> that's so, hot, hot area too. Yeah. So Arun highlighted, right, you know, there are different class of customers, right? You know, we work very cl closely with the hyperscalers. Yeah. And there is this race to singularity, right? How can I mimic the human brain? <laughs> and, you know, there's massive investment that goes on. The size of these large language models is going to you know, every time you go to a next generation, it's 10x yeah. the compute. So we are, when we look at this class of customers, oh, thank you so much. Right, you're looking at data centers that consume, yes, power is a huge issue like we discussed, but now you're even talking about clusters which are not 32,000 nodes, 100,000 yeah. nodes, they are like half a million, a million yeah. GPUs. And once you're doing this, you're not even in a data center, you're actually going across data centers that may be hundreds of kilometers apart. So how do you solve that problem, right? Yeah. You know, you're, you know, now your super computer is now across hundreds of kilometers. Uh, so how do you deal with cooling? How do you deal with power? How do you deal with latency, right? In, in these kind of environments. And, and, and then the other class of customers that we have talked to is inference is becoming important as these new GPU vendors coming, coming out. We've talked a lot about scale out for ethernet, for example. What we are also now being requested is, look, this one domain, which is a scale-up domain in networking, how can we move to this Ethernet? Yeah. And we believe that Ethernet can have the latency yeah. required for these, these use cases. It has the other yeah. capabilities from link level retries, you know, supporting small packets yeah. um, at a very high throughput. Yeah and we believe we can solve that problem as well. And that's something yeah. that we have Well, you guys are on. great. I wish I had more time. I wish I had an hour podcast on this one topic. But I want to wrap up and get on the record your vision, all of your visions on AI factories. This is basically the AI factory story playing out in, in front of us. Um, because the end customer, at the end of the day, are building big apps. And they're going to have the, the new category of generative AI in it. And they're going to be big workloads. And they're going to provide a lot of business value and, and societal value, whether it's climate change or you know, for business productivity, because we're going to see that productivity wave coming. Yes. That's a killer app, productivity. Yeah. Yeah. And the economics, are, we've been doing all kinds of forecasts on, Dave's got trillions in his mind, and we're like, okay, I need to scope this. But it's clear, the magnitude is huge. Yes. So this is the AI factory. What's the vision? Where does this go next? Arun, we'll start with you. I think what we're going to see is this AI factory concept is going to go to 500 kilowatt racks, right? We had at 150 today, it's going to go to 500. Validated software, validated hardware, interoperability across systems in open standards is where the industry is going. Go back to the 90s, right? Open standards, industry one. I think this is what's going to happen here too. In the next three to five years, you're going to see massive rack scale systems, open standards. That's what I see. Nassan? I agree with Arun, right? Which is, uh, what we'll see is, um, we'll see the scale become bigger and bigger over the next four years, but we'll also see this go down to other verticals, right? You know, we'll see enterprise adopt this. So, yes, uh, and in, from a networking perspective, we believe Ethernet will win. It's already on its way. <laughs> and, uh, and it can scale from the largest clusters on yeah. the planet yeah. to whatever optimizations that are required 
for inference and other use cases. Ethernet continues to thunder away as value. Yeah. Rasali, take us home. You got yes. the factory right there. Your vision, where this goes next. I think where this goes next is that how we can create a highly scalable data center yeah. campus that can be deployed in less than six months so that customers who have invested in this very, very costly or expensive GPU yeah. and the power, yeah. they can harness the benefits of that with their AI workloads so they can be competitive in the market. Their time to market improves, their revenue to market improves. So we are laser focused on serving those customer yeah. requirements, partnering with Dell and Broadcom to create as small footprint as possible, as modular as possible, and as efficient as possible such that we can deploy the new data center for the customer in this form factor yeah. in the least possible amount of time. Bigger, faster, more power, yes. performance, less power usage. We're here in the Cube factory doing our part, just sending all the content out here from supercomputing. Of course, we're going to have our digital twin program we're going to have in the studio, content continuing. I think we've been the digital twin because it's, you mentioned factory, of course. Yeah. Um, great job, thank you so much for, for coming you. on. AI factories are here, they're real, and they will change the game because the workloads are hungry and they're in demand. Again, great time to be in tech. Thanks for watching. <laughs>